In essence, Hopefield Financial Footstep number two is what comes between saving your starter emergency fund and really focusing on paying off debt. It doesn't necessarily need to delay your paying off debt, but I want to emphasize that there should be a focus on the following, learning how to budget so that you have a good strategy for controlling your money, updating your insurance so you defer any risk that you can't take on yourself and possibly find some savings that will help you pay more on your debt. Stop adding more debt. If the path to a hope-filled financial future involves getting out of consumer debt, it's counterproductive to add more while we're working on this step. Next, don't go alone. The path to hope-filled financial success is not necessarily easy. I cannot emphasize how much harder it is if you try to do this alone. Lastly, begin your plan with the end in mind and understand what is motivating you to complete the journey for your hope-filled financial future. In hope-filled financial footstep number one, we talked about saving a starter emergency fund. A starter emergency fund that is less than a full three to six months of expenses if you have consumer debt. Reason being is it takes a while to save up a fully funded emergency fund and we don't want to delay paying off our debt too long because interest is racking up and it's going to put us further and further behind if we delay. That's why in the first step we save up enough to stay off the ankle biters as fast as possible. The starter emergency fund is a very nice beginning foundation that helps us take care of the littlest things that can trip us up and make us feel like we failed, make us feel like we're not going to succeed in the long run. But we need to set up an even better foundation so that as we move forward, we are very likely to succeed. We need a strategy that is structured to help us win. When it comes to making goals that actually succeed, I think one of the best tips I've ever gotten is to make sure that that goal is written down. When it comes to a plan that is designed to succeed, we need to be able to write that plan down. We need to have a game plan for our money. And having a regular game plan for our money month to month takes practice. And it's something that doesn't necessarily come naturally to all of us. Having a written plan for your money oftentimes is called a budget. Don't get scared by the word budget there. What we're trying to do is simply have a written plan that we can follow. Now, I'm not going to go into budgeting in depth in this episode. That's something that I've done before in an episode that I'll link in the description below. But it is important to have a written game plan for our money. If we do not have a written plan for what we're going to be doing each month, how do we know whether or not a decision is going to throw us off track? How do we know? To say no to an impulse whim. Well, we don't unless we've assigned every dollar a mission. So the first thing we need to start doing in Hope Field Financial Footstep number two to take control is have a written plan and have a budget. Now stick with me here. If you've tried budgeting before and it didn't feel like something that worked for you, I've got a question. Do you have a credit card? Because here's the thing. If you've tried budgeting before and it just didn't seem to work, didn't seem to allow you to have control. Well, maybe we need to change a circumstance around that. A good majority of us don't keep a budget. We don't keep a written budget, that is. You might say you have a budget, but if it's all up here, it's not a written plan. And I want you to have a written plan. I think it's a powerful way to take control. Having a credit card naturally disincentivizes us from managing our money in a way that we know what it's doing every month. Think about it. If you didn't have a tool that allowed you to pay back money later. And if you didn't have the money this month, that's okay because it just carries over as a balance and you get to it when you get to it. If you didn't have that tool, if that was taken away from you, what pressure would you feel? For me, I would feel like the the hair on my neck standing up. Like, oh no, if I don't have a credit card to use, I need to know where my money's going and I need to know when and I need to know why. I need to know how, and I need to, I need to, how much is in my bank account now? I don't want to overdraft. So removing a credit card or all the credit cards from the situation here invites a natural pressure. If you feel like it's scary to do that, well, you're experiencing the natural pressure to have a written plan for your money, the natural plan to prevent overdrafts, the natural plan to make sure that you're not outspending your income. Let's face it, the credit card is the one tool that naturally enables us to easily, with almost no friction, outspend our income. So I urge you in this step, if you're going to try budgeting and it's not worked out for you before, 
take your credit cards and do a little bit of a challenge with them, at least until you're out of debt. A temporary thing. You can do this. You can you can exercise a little bit of willpower for a temporary challenge. I want you to get a little Tupperware, put your credit cards in all of them, fill it about halfway up with water, and pop it in the freezer. What you're doing is you're locking your credit cards in a block of ice to if you actually really, really genuinely needed them to cover one of your four walls, you could go and thaw that little block of ice out and you could take care of the emergency that necessitates you go deeper into debt. But you're probably not going to want to go and thaw that block of ice out to get to the credit card so you can go to the movies when it wasn't in the budget. And keep in mind that if you're going to accept the credit card freeze challenge, you're going to want to delete the digital memory from your browsers and e-commerce websites and your phone that that just knows your credit card number. That way you're not tempted to use your credit card through those means. I see you. And after you do this, you can try to engage with the budget again, this time with a natural pressure that's going to encourage you to stick to it. And I want you to give yourself the grace to try this budgeting thing for at least three months before you make a determination to yourself how much you do and do not like it. Now, as you're running your budget, you might realize that there's not as much wiggle room in there as you want. You would like to free up more of your income. That way we have more money to use against the debt in the next hope-filled financial footstep. And the second part of taking control works with that and helps us defer risk that we can't afford to have now. Insurance is a tool that allows us to defer risk that we can't afford to take on now. And there are insurance products that are essential for almost everybody here listening. And then there are insurance products that are once or redundant to something that is a necessity. For example, you could get insurance for cancer, but if your health insurance would cover you for cancer, then why do you need cancer insurance on top of it? Or here's another example, accidental death and dismemberment insurance. If you die due to an accident or dismemberment, does that mean that your family needs to have more money than if you died by other means? In that circumstance, you're not double dead and your family doesn't need to have double coverage on you for, for those purposes. So we can evaluate our insurance situation, learn a little bit about insurance, shop around a little bit, see if we can get something with a lower premium but isn't exposing us to undue risk, make sure that we're covered, and hopefully through this exercise we can trim out a little bit more room in the budget so that we can apply more power to knocking out the debt. Okay, so here's where we are with building our foundation. We have a little bit of money that gives us a little bit of a buffer between anything that might happen to us and falling back into debt. We've updated our insurance to defer risk that we can't afford and hopefully shop around and trim up a little bit more room in our budget. With this taken care of, we're almost ready to tackle our debt, but we need to commit to not adding any more debt to the pile. If we want to get out of debt, adding more debt to our situation is simply counterproductive. And we need to recognize what tools have enabled us to add more debt to the pile easily. I've already mentioned freezing credit cards. I think that's a great way to prevent you from adding more debt through a credit card, but those aren't the only things you need to be on the lookout for. I'll describe it as a competitor to the credit card, but a buy now pay later service is an easy way for you to add more debt to the pile when something's not in the budget. And you need to simply commit yourself to not using such a tool while you're trying to pay off your debts. And that can be really hard, but that's where the budget does indeed help you. If you don't write something into the budget for this month, and you don't feel like you can go back and add it in without compromising either your progress in paying off debt or one of your four walls, one of your needs, housing, food, utilities, or transportation, well, you simply have to tell yourself no. The budget is going to give you the actual evidence to say no. And I'm, right now I want to say if you're worried about doing a budget because you're you're concerned you're going to have to tell yourself no more often, well, you're simply recognizing that at the moment you're out spending your income as it is and you're worried about making a change to be more responsible. I want you to think about that and let it sink in as we cover the last two points for taking control with your money. The next one is going to be don't go alone. It's dangerous to go alone. Take this. It can be very challenging to accomplish any major goal in a vacuum without a community, without someone to hold us accountable. So if you're married, you got to make sure that your spouse is on board. You got to talk through your plan and strategy and do this arm in arm. Do it together 
so that you can be walking toward a common, hope-filled financial future and hold each other accountable to the steps. And if you're not married, you need to have someone in your life that you're comfortable talking with about money, about personal finances, someone who may be going on the journey alongside you in their own way so you can hold each other accountable. If you know that someone's going to ask you if you stuck to your budget, if you know that someone is going to ask you, hey, which step are you on? Or are you on on pace with your plan, with your goals? Well, you're going to be much more likely to keep them. You're going to be much more likely to keep a promise that you've made to yourself and that you've made publicly known to someone else whom you trust. They're going to be, through accountability, there to catch you when you feel like you're falling and getting ready to fail. All right, that builds a beautiful foundation for the rest of the Hope-Filled Financial Footsteps, with one exception, and that is going to be your personal motivation. What is it that currently, right now, is driving you to want to make a change? If you've made it to this point in the podcast, I know that you want to make a change in your future. You've listened to me talk about all sorts of different stories. You've listened to me talk about budgets in the abstract. Something is driving you. Can you write down what that thing is now? Why do you want to take control of your money? Why do you want to get out of debt? Why do you want to have a healthy nest egg for the future? And you might have multiple reasons. Some of us don't want to be a burden on our family when we retire. Some of us want to be financially stable, breaking the paycheck to paycheck cycle so we can start a family. And your why can go incredibly deep. I could go through countless examples, but I think you know what your whys are. Can you write them down today as a part of taking control? If you were to look forward in the Hope-Filled Financial Footsteps all the way to Hope-Filled Financial Footsteps number eight, that's when you get to live your dream. What is the dream at the other side of financial independence, on the other side of having ultimate control over your money? Being able to work because you want to, not because you have to. What is it that you would do if you didn't have to work to earn money? Well, write that dream down and make that be part of your why. Begin this plan with the end in mind. Put that thing on your fridge. Put that thing on your bathroom mirror. What is your end goal? What is your dream? What is your why? And let that drive you so that if you run into cracks in the foundation as you're building it in this step, as you're getting ready to pay off debt, and as you're getting ready to embark on an epic journey for hope-filled financial success, Let this motivation be there. Let this why help you take control and drive you beyond. And if you feel comfortable sharing what your why is, what your motivation is, what your dream is, please share it in the comments below if you're listening on a platform with a comment section. I would love to see it, and I know others can be inspired by your dream. And with that, until next week, until next Tuesday, budget bravely and enjoy your hope-filled financial future. Enjoy your dream.